Devil's Pass, released in 2013, directed by Rennie Harlan, and based upon the infamous Dyatlov Pass incident, in which nine Russian skiers died under extremely bizarre and mysterious circumstances, reveals a beautifully shot, found footage styled horror film. One which often abandons the bouncing camera of the genre and allows us to breathe and take in the epic scenery of northern Russia and includes a set of well-developed and semi-believable characters, a unique and well-thought-out pair of monsters, and a mythologically developed and researched world of real-life conspiracy theories and unsolved mysteries. Harlan studied the government archives in Moscow and his own theory on the Dyatlov Pass incident is that a government experiment went wrong. It should be noted, many names and even events are altered from the true life Dyatlov Pass incident. So trying to find a concrete history through the film will leave you with a somewhat false mythology. That said, what Harlan has accomplished is a truly creepy and well thought out science fiction conspiracy based found footage horror film one whose monsters are visually quite masterful. We will dive into the found footage horror that is the Devil's Pass, as well as give a brief explanation of the histories of the conspiracy theories it uses to establish its plot and mythology, and why it is a strong entry amidst a genre full of gold and lead, all whilst providing a synopsis of the plot. Before we do, please hit that like and subscribe and ring the bell as it is the only way I can grow. And without any further ado, I present for your consideration, Devil's Pass. Holly Goss stars as the lead character, director Holly King. When a professor assigns her a project on the Dyatlov Pass, a subject she is already obsessed with, her friend Jensen suggests they make a video. She applies for and receives a grant and begins to prepare a group for the Polat Saikil, literally translated, the Mountain of the Dead. Known as the Dead Mountain in reality. Named by the local Indian tribe, the Mansi. And in their language, translating simply to lack of game. We are introduced to her crew, Gemma Atkinson as Denise Evers, an audio engineer. Ryan Hawley as Andy Thatcher, an expert who has climbed almost every mountain in the US as well as the AT and is seeking a new challenge. Luke Albright as J.P. Hauser Jr., an expert climber who spent a year climbing in the Himalayas. And Matt Stoko as Jensen Day, the co-director and conspiracy theorist. Jensen goes into the various conspiracy theories that attempt to explain the Dyatlov Pass incident, such as aliens, as the Monsi saw fireballs in the sky. When in reality, a group of hikers about 50 kilometers south of the incident did report seeing strange orange spheres in the sky to the north on the night in question. Similar objects were spotted in Ivedo and adjacent areas from February to March 1959 by various independent witnesses, as well as the meteorology service and military, but it was not initially reported. Jensen also theorizes Yeti could be the explanation he rebukes the supposed more rational explanations as being laughable, such as avalanches or paradoxical undressing, in which hypothermia causes the victim to undress. We cut to a news report explaining the group has disappeared and given ideas of the spirit world by the local Monsi Indians. We then learn that the footage of the lost group was uploaded by hackers to the internet, thus giving us a movie to watch. We then return to the traditional narrative, following Holly as she leads her group from Oregon to the Polat Saikil mountain in Russia, and eventually the Dyatlov Pass itself. They arrive in Russia and try to meet with Peter Karov at a hospital or care center. They are informed he is dead, but when they look to his window, he shows them a sign which reads stay away in Russian. He is then pulled away by staff. In reality, Peter Karov is a changed name of the only surviving member of the original Dyatlov group, who in real life was forced back early due to sciatic pain, and is named Yuri Yudin, and died in 2013. 
When they go to the local bar, they drink super Russian moonshine to celebrate, as the original Dyatlov group did. When in reality, the group likely did not drink any alcohol at all and ate loaves of bread to maintain energy. Here they meet Sergei, who says he will gladly take them all to the mountains. The next day they meet Sergei's aunt, who was part of the original rescue team at Dyatlov. She explains the original crew found 11 bodies, not nine, and two were different, more so than the others. Something was wrong with them, and they were next to a strange machine. They then hit the slopes. Later, while en route to the pass and camping for the night, the northern lights are playing fire in the sky, while Jensen is watching for UFOs and doesn't even notice the dancing colors. Nicely developing his character as a conspiracy theorist and intent on his goals, as he explains balls of orange light were seen the night before the original incident. Somewhere around here the cameras begin to flicker, as is the cliché in the genre, when the monsters get closer. At one point, the camera goes a bit haywire, and what almost appears to be, at least on my first glance, a pair of Yeti are seen stalking the group from the mountain. That morning, they awaken to a long and monstrous set of footprints left by creatures that seem to fly down from the sky, walk around the camp, and fly away. Holly assumes a bear or snow tiger has done this. Jensen assumes Yeti. While the pro mountaineers assume Holly is screwing with them, telling her this is the last place in the world you would want anyone freaked out. They then find a weather tower with the same type of footprints leading to it. Inside, they find a human tongue. They begin to hear howl-like noises, and Jensen tells Holly he has heard them before in a bad acid trip from his youth. It is here Holly admits she has felt a magnetic pull to this place ever since she was a child, when she dreamed of this pass, and a door within, and on the other side a dark blackness that swallowed her up. She knows they will figure it out, as they are meant to be there. They then reach the Dyatlov Pass, as Holly draws red body lines and makes her documentary diving into the history of the Dyatlov Pass incident. And as already mentioned, much of the history is correct, and much is not. The group's GPS begins going crazy, and Andy wants to leave as he is worried their map is bad and they're flying blind. As they reach the pass far too early, he begins to believe there is a magnetic field in the rock and they should move to escape it. JP thinks it is too late, and they should camp there, even though he does not want to. Holly employs her Geiger counter, which hints at radiation. Following it, she finds a huge bunker with a solid metal door frozen shut. On further inspection, they find it locks from the outside. Jensen is scared to open it, theorizing it was designed to keep whatever was inside trapped in. Holly opts to not tell the others, as she thinks it will freak them out. That night, there is a number of loud booms from what seems to be explosions triggering an avalanche, which kills Denise and injures Andy's leg. They reset it and argue about using the flare gun or not, as they are not sure if military actually caused the avalanche and is after them, as Jensen believes. Later, they tell JP about the door, and he decides they should shoot a flare, as it would tell people they are there and discourage anyone from killing them. While shooting the flare, Jensen notices it creates an orange ball of fire in the sky. Shortly after, two Russians appear hiking up the mountain. Andy says they have no packs and they got there way too fast. They are obviously after them. He begs the others to run as he is too wounded, keeps the flare gun with him and is engaged in a gunfight with them. They quickly shoot him and fire at the others as they flee. JP is shot and wounded while they escape into the bunker and the soldiers lock them in from the outside. They turn on the power and are introduced to a dark underground military installation. While exploring, they find a book full of soldiers missing in action and dates in Russian. Ending in 1959, they find pictures of the USS Eldridge as the Philadelphia experiment is drawn into the plot, a real life conspiracy theory of which a video all its own would need to be made to truly dissect all the mythology, characters, 
accusations and developments. But suffice to say, the experiment was a supposed test or multiple tests in invisibility and or teleportation, and that the Navy destroyer the Eldridge was possibly rendered invisible or even teleported from Philadelphia to Norfolk, Virginia, 200 miles away. Supposedly the result was the fusing of many of the crew to the hull and driving others crazy. In lore and in the movie, the Eldritch returned 10 minutes early. The teleportation idea and time travel does tie well into the movie. And using the Philadelphia experiment adds a nice level of realism to the film. Further exploration leads them to a nuclear power cell. They find a dead soldier with no tongue and what seems to be an execution chamber with tons of mutated and seemingly executed bodies. Eventually, they find a copy of their own video camera. Watching it, they track it down to the moment that is currently happening, before the battery dies, meaning this camera came from the future. The monsters appear and are quite horrific, mutated, undead-like entities teleporting about and moving in contorted demonic-like motions, flickering in and out of existence, effectively employing a dark and malevolent visual depiction as they chase the main characters through the dark tunnels of the underground bunker. They kill JP and seem to be leading our remaining two, Holly and Jensen, in the direction of their desire. The monsters chase them into an underground cavern where Holly and Jensen are able to seal them off with a door. Inside there is a giant, almost Lovecraftian or Gigaresque tunnel. Jensen theorizes it is a teleporter or a wormhole. There are cave drawings around it, indicating it was found by the Monsi and not made by the government. Although they think the government may have been trying to weaponize it. Jensen realizes that if it is a portal and those creatures came out of it with the ability to teleport, it would explain the Philadelphia experiment and the Mothman sightings in Point Pleasant and various other conspiracies. The Mothman, a being sighted in Point Pleasant around November 12th, 1966 to December 15th, 1967, and in various other places, would in my opinion not be explained by this portal or by these creatures as it looks entirely different and has an entirely different set of lore and mythology. The Mothman's general mythology involves him contacting or haunting certain people, either warning them of coming disasters to help them or to scare them and then causing the disasters itself. Either way, it is somewhat out of place and does not explain the Mothman, but it does add a certain weight to the monsters simply mentioning conspiracy theories that exist in reality as possibly being related to the devil's past mythology and somehow explaining each other and trying to get the conspiracies to stack up when it is not dissected in real time and you are able to allow it to flow within the film it does add a nice level of weight to the lore contained within the devil's past and its monsters but does not in any way explain the mothman in the case of the Philadelphia experiment, this is done rather well and would actually explain a great deal of the film's monsters, teleportation, and the time travel elements. Holly cries as she realizes her dream came true. She opened the door into the darkness that will swallow her. Rather than wait the monsters out and starve to death, they decide to enter the portal. Jensen believes since there's no controls, the portal leads to one definitive place or anywhere. And you simply imagine where you would want to go. They eventually step through, thinking of the mountain outside, as the monsters would be locked inside and it is the freshest place in their minds. When they step through, they arrive in 1959, seemingly dead and changed. Monstrous. Sergei's aunt now young, finds them, and a group of soldiers drives her away. The soldiers take all of the bodies of the Dyatlov incident and Holly and Jensen's bodies, as well as their video camera, but place them in a separate area on hooks. As the movie ends and the shot cuts away, 
they begin to move. And we see the female body has a tattoo identical to Holly's, showing the birth of the monsters and the eventual fate of Holly and Jensen. Overall, Devil's Pass is a fun and creepy watch with a well-developed story and set of monsters whose creation, in my opinion, is explained, developed, and executed quite well. Whilst the histories and conspiracy theories surrounding them can be thin, they effectively develop the situation and the characters, whilst risking offending Dyatlov Pass researchers who might have stumbled on this movie for a fun romp by perhaps changing too many histories, the movie still draws from the lore quite effectively and utilizes it to create and develop its unique monsters, setting, and plot. I would recommend The Devil's Pass to anyone that is a fan of the found footage genre or anyone that enjoys studying unsolved mysteries, such as the Dyatlov Pass incident itself. As long as they realize, much of the history is flawed. This is, in my opinion, a very unique and original and effective take. In a genre full of copycats and cliched paranormal activity, Blair Witch, and Slenderman-based clones. Thank you so much for wading through the insanities of The Devil's Pass with me. If you liked any of this, please hit that like and subscribe, and ring the bell. I have new videos coming out all the time, and until then, keep sleepwalking, my friends.